Ruth Ann Guiley Kramer, mother of Beth Kramer and Elaine Kramer, died November 15, 2017 at Asbury Place, a continuing care facility near Pittsburgh. She was 97. She had Alzheimer's disease for many years and died of complications from breaking her hip in August. Ruth Ann was born May 7, 1920. She had always appreciated how her life spanned the great leaps in communication, from telegrams to party lines to cell phones. She'd like knowing this tribute to her life came in the form of a video shared on social media. Ruth Ann was the third of four children born to a middle-class German-American family in Cincinnati, Ohio. Her mother, Hilda Shale Guiley, came from a musical family and had a beautiful voice and sang professionally in church and concert choirs. Ruth Ann and her sisters grew up with a song in the house, classical music on the Victrola, and a piano for all to play. Mom's deep repertoire of songs and love of music became part of our childhood as well. Ruth Ann's father, August Guiley, worked at the Provident Bank and rose through the ranks to become a vice president. During the Depression, he voted with the other bank officers to cut their own pay so that workers at the bank wouldn't lose their jobs. Some often repeated stories of her childhood included one about how she always offered to help her dad in the yard work in order to escape from indoor chores, which she detested. From those hours outside with her dad, she developed a love of gardening, which she passed along to both of us. To this day, Descendants of her bearded iris, daylilies, and columbines grace gardens in locations where she, her nieces, and family have lived. Ruth Ann graduated from Ursuline Academy, a Catholic girls' high school, where she tried her first cigarette, which she hated. She briefly attended the University of Cincinnati, where she, in her words, majored in boys. That academic career went about as you'd expect. She lasted one semester. She then enrolled in and completed a course in a secretarial school and soon was working at Rich Ladder Company. Very much a typical girl of her generation, Ruth Ann's life's dream was to marry and have children. She met Lee Kramer on a blind date to a bunny hop, an event that we daughters have always had a difficult time imagining. She later learned that she was the third on the list of girls for him to call, and that the first two were busy. But Lee, whose nickname was Dink, and Ruth Ann had perfect chemistry, and soon were courting. In 1942, he was called up to the Army. She traveled, daringly, by train to El Paso, Texas, to see him at Fort Bliss when he completed basic training. They made their promises, and he gave her a ring. She wrote to him daily while he was overseas, first in North Africa and then in Europe, using carbon paper to make copies of letters she sent to him and matching those later with the ones he sent to her in return. She also retyped his letters, leaving out the more private sentiments, and circulated the redacted versions to their families. When Dad was discharged in November 1945, Mom told her mother that she wanted to get married in December. In that era of premarital chastity, it must have seemed impossible to wait more than a couple weeks. That's too soon. I can't plan a wedding that fast, her mother replied. So Ruth Ann and Lee reluctantly agreed to set the date a month later. They married on January 12, 1946, at St. Andrew's Church in Avondale, and took a week-long honeymoon to New York City, traveling by sleeper train to New York and flying home on American Airlines. Ruth Anna Dink bought a small post-war house on DeArmond Avenue in Cincinnati for $6,000, living with Hilda and Gus until construction was completed. They furnished it with their first pieces of furniture, a sewing machine, modest dreams, and a lot of love. Ruth Ann continued to work as a secretary, and Dink also got a job at Rich Ladder Company. Mom read a lot, mostly novels at that point, but throughout her life she had a stack of library books at home. 
She, her sisters, and mother passed around copies of Women's Day, McCall's, and Reader's Digest. But one year, in the late 1940s, as a gift from her employer, she was offered subscriptions of any two magazines of her choice. She decided on the two most expensive ones. Why not? Which were The Atlantic Monthly and Harper's. She knew nothing about them at the time, but it turned out that those magazines changed her life. She had been reared in a rather conservative family as a gregarious girl with conventional plans for her own future. The Atlantic and Harper's opened her eyes to different progressive ideas and a great inviting world that curiosity could open. The two magazines were always in our home during our childhoods and in our own homes as adults. Ruth Ann and Dink wished for a baseball team of children, but things didn't turn out that way. When no children came for a few years, they decided to have an adventure. They loaded up their 1949 Ford and drove to Los Angeles. They visited national parks, the Hoover Dam, Redwoods, Hollywood, and California missions. After six months in LA, they moved north to Corvallis, Oregon where dad could work on his college degree at Oregon State, while mom worked as a secretary in the home economics department. When she at last became pregnant in 1952, they decided to return to Cincinnati before Beth's arrival so that they could be near their families. There already were nieces and nephews on both sides, and Ruth Ann and Dink wanted cousins, aunts, uncles, and grandparents to be part of her kids' lives. Our parents bought an acre of land on Beech Tree Drive in a new subdivision in Finneytown. They did much of the work themselves. They attached the siding, hung the drywall, laid the hardwood floors and linoleum, and painted inside and out. How they knew those skills, we, their daughters, can't imagine, but they did. Around that time, Dink changed jobs to become a salesman for Sunshine Biscuits, selling cookies and crackers in a large territory of Cincinnati. Elaine was born in 1957. Ruth Ann reveled in motherhood, in sewing, gardening, cooking, baking, and developing friendships with her neighbors. Housework, not so much. There were usually neighborhoods playing at our house, and our dress-up chest, which Ruth Ann supplied with her cast-off party dresses, was the source of endless imaginary events. We upended closets to imagine ourselves on a train trip. We obliterated her plans for a storage area under the basement stairs so that it could become the den of witch snickersnee. When Beth entered second grade, Ruth Ann trained to become a brownie leader, and our basement became the home of Troop 26. Lee was promoted to sales manager and assigned a territory in Louisville, Kentucky metropolitan area. In 1964, the family moved to New Albany, Indiana, across the Ohio River from Louisville, and two hours from Cincinnati. Ruth Ann and Dink bought a house with a view of the city amid surroundings that, at the time, were more rural than suburban. With both daughters in school, Ruth Ann set about becoming involved in her new community. She started a brownie troupe for Elaine's age group and joined a craft club. The move to a new city occurred when, on the national level, the times they were a-changing. Through the 1960s, Ruth Ann continued her self-education by reading constantly. She read magazines and books and newspapers. She read about history, art, politics, science, and current events. By then, a confident, capable, middle-aged woman, she became increasingly aware of the evils of racial discrimination and the injustice of sex discrimination. She walked in local marches in support of civil rights. She canvassed door-to-door for George McGovern. She joined anti-war protests in Louisville following Kent State. She despised everything George Wallace said and mistrusted Richard Nixon from the beginning. She wept for Dr. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. When she perceived social inequity or disagreed with decisions in Washington, she wrote letters to her senators, congressman, and to the editor of the paper, not just once, but many times. As we, her daughters, got older, 
Mom tried to pass along to us some of her many skills. She taught us to sew, to knit, to make a big pot of soup. She taught us to prepare favorite German foods like geta and potato salad dressed with bacon drippings. She showed us how to bake bread and make pies from scratch. No mixes or frozen shells in Ruth Ann's house. Every year at the holiday season, she would make a dozen delicious fruitcakes and huge batches of Christmas cookies to give away as gifts. We learned from mom how to design a garden and the seasonal care of plants and trees. One year when dad asked her what she wanted for Mother's Day, she replied, a load of manure, a gardening lesson we've always remembered. Beyond skills, mom taught us much more by example. She taught us to live within a budget and consider frugality a virtue. She good-naturedly accepted our teasing about reusing aluminum foil and plastic bags in the era between the Depression and the Reduce, Reuse, Recycle when others could not see the point. She taught us about sticking to your guns and by example the value of reading, questioning, and curiosity about the world. That was Elaine speaking. And now, this is Beth. Ruth Ann also raised her daughters to feel, love, and care with ferocity. She urged each girl in her orbit, her daughters, her scouts, and nieces, to consider themselves as good as any boy and to strive for success on their own terms. She was encourager-in-chief of the shy, the willful, the timid, the self-confident, the fearful, and the brave girls and young women around her. She excelled in caregiving, nursing her mother in our home in Hilda's dying months. Ruthann didn't articulate it, but it was clear that she felt she could make a difference in people's lives, both as a community volunteer and on a direct personal level. She befriended an elderly woman who had no living relatives and visited her regularly for years at the old folks' home in New Albany. She often invited foreign graduate students for weekend visits in order to show them American hospitality and to learn from their perspectives. With a friend from Girl Scouts, she volunteered weekly for about 15 years as a reader for Recording for the Blind and she tutored a young boy whose own parents were not readers. She initiated hosting two foreign exchange students when Elaine was in high school. She and Dink volunteered with the local historical society museum that was starting up in the old Carnegie Library building in New Albany. Speaking of libraries, as Beth headed off for college and Elaine to high school, Ruthann decided to get a job outside the home and applied to the library. Though she had no degree, she was so obviously a substantial intellect that she nailed a job as a reference librarian at the New Albany Floyd County Public Library. She worked at the reference desk and in the local history room for about 20 years, taking questions from patrons and cataloging the collections. For most of those years, the work was all paper but she was there for the onset of the digital age and learned fundamental skills as computers were introduced in the 1980s and 1990s. Her income became very important in the late 1970s when Dink got laid off from Sunshine Biscuits. By then, Beth had married Michael Stagg, whose humor, curiosity, and sense of adventure made him an instant fit in the family. They moved to Baltimore, then Pine Ridge, South Dakota, then Seattle, then Tacoma, then Massachusetts, and eventually overseas. With more time at home, Dink became the baker, housekeeper, cook, and Ruth Ann coached him. Their marriage continued to be a relationship of delight, dedication, humor, companionship, and enduring love. Ruth Ann and Dink dreamed of travel, but knew their income would not allow for much. In 1983, after Dink was diagnosed with lymphoma, they carefully undertook a trip to Europe to visit villages where their ancestors had come from and to see the places Dink had been stationed at the end of World War II. Soon after that, 
Stink's illness progressed with speed, and he died at home on January 1, 1984. Ruth Ann, naturally inconsolable at the loss of the love of her life, fell into a grief that was lifted over time by Elaine's marriage that year to Joel Shaw, a steady, kind, and outgoing man, and by a new dedication to working out. She started swimming 30 laps a day, a habit she maintained into her 80s. She went back to school and earned an associate's degree in liberal arts. A few months after Dink died, she received another bombshell, a modest inheritance from a distant relative of Dink's, with whom Ruth Ann had been affectionate and attentive by mail correspondence. This second cousin had no heirs, but quite unbeknownst to our parents, had accumulated a nest egg. To the two people who had been sensitive to her loneliness and interested in her life, she left her estate. With Dink gone, the amount went to Ruth Ann, and without that money, she would have had very significant financial struggles ahead. Through the 1980s, Ruth Ann maintained the family home and her job in New Albany. But with Beth living overseas and Elaine in Connecticut, she felt more lonely and isolated. At this point, she gave her daughters another gift by putting her affairs in order long before she needed to. In the early 1990s, she sold her house, arranged her finances, got rid of extraneous possessions, and moved to Connecticut. Thereafter, she moved wherever Elaine and Joel went to live, renting an apartment nearby. In every location, Middletown, Connecticut, Allentown, Pennsylvania, Longwood, Florida, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, she made new friends, planted a garden, and volunteered at the local library. She also started her new life as a world traveler. There were so many places to see, and there were grandchildren to visit. With Beth and Michael and their daughters Caitlin and Hannah living in New Delhi, Saudi Arabia, Beijing, and then Singapore, adventures awaited. Ruthann became an enthusiastic participant in Elder Hostel, an educational touring company for older people. She combined these learning and adventure experiences with family visits, but also chose other travel destinations based on her own curiosity. She saw Machu Picchu and the Kremlin, the Great Wall of China, and Big Ben. She went north of the Arctic Circle and into the pyramids. She rode a camel, swam in the Red Sea, hiked into the crater of Mount Etna. With her grandchildren, now also including Elaine and Joel's daughters, Emma and Ellie, she was inviting, without being demanding, a kind and thoughtful presence who loved each individual at each age. There were tea parties with stuffed animals, picnics, dress-ups, crafts, baking, shadow puppets and lullabies at sleepovers, Halloween costume sewing, applesauce making, praise for good grades and encouragement after disappointing ones, songs, books, consoling hugs, and sage advice without judgments. She babysat to give weary daughters and sons-in-law breaks from their routines. In 2004, her family noticed signs that her forgetfulness was becoming a problem. While living in Florida, she began to have trouble navigating home on congested roads. Soon after, while living in Pittsburgh, she had to give up her car. Bethany Lane helped her choose a continuing care community Asbury Heights, two blocks from Elaine's house in Mount Lebanon. She had independence in a small apartment and then no need for a car. Ruth Ann's Alzheimer's disease advanced and plateaued and then advanced relentlessly over the next years, forcing an end to her traveling days, her swimming regimen, and her ability to read. In the early stages, Ruth, under, Ruth Ann understood quite well what was happening and what was to come, and it terrified her. She and Elaine would hold each other and sob, both knowing what the future held. 
The grief abated as Ruth Ann's memory faltered, for she found some pleasure in life in the moment as the years passed. Though she could hold her thoughts for only a few seconds, she understood her world at any given time. She enjoyed jigsaw puzzles, sing-alongs of old songs, the loving presence of her family, and especially chocolate. Despite her diminished abilities, Ruth Ann retained her social grace until her final months. Thank you for all you do, she constantly told the kind staff members at Asbury Heights, Asbury Place, and Family Hospice. Later, as she required more hands-on care, it was, I like you, but I don't like what you're doing. In August this year, Ruth Ann fell and broke a hip. She made it through surgery to repair the wound. She made it through rehab to walk again with her walker. But exhaustion and other complications took their toll, and she declined rapidly. Ruth Ann died peacefully in her bed under twinkling white lights, embraced by the love of her family. Ruth Ann's ashes are to be interred in the spot next to Dink's at St. Mary's of the Knob Cemetery, Floyd's Knobs, Indiana.